Welcome to today's Community Cast. My name is Matt Morgan. I'm the pastor at Community Brookside, a new church plant in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are so blessed by your presence, and we hope that today's content will bring you joy. All right, friends, we're going to start out this morning by reading some scripture. So if you brought your Bibles today, I invite you to pull them out. We are opening up to the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. This is a scripture we've heard before but I think it's time we address it again. So if you would, open your Bibles, Acts 8, 26 through 40. If you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. We've got it here on the screen so you can follow along. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in the charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of the scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a, lamb was be- as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is a prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared to Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. What an interesting story, right? So <clears throat> what we don't know is some of the context of the story based on where we started. So I've got to go back in time a little bit. Philip was a disciple of Jesus Christ, and he was doing good work for the gospel. If we read Scripture a little bit before that in, in Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, which we will in just a minute... We can see that Philip was preaching about Jesus. He was changing lives. He was inviting people to come and join the movement of the gospel. He was making a difference. And people in the area where he was, because he was now in Samaria, people in the area were putting their faith and their trust in Jesus. He was evangelizing, right? We've all heard that word, evangelizing. He was an evangelist for the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he was making a big difference. But the Spirit asked him to go somewhere else. Let's read Acts chapter 8, 4 through 8. It says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So, Even though Philip was doing incredible work, he was casting out demons, he was healing people, people were excited about what was going on, they were being baptized, he was changing lives. The Spirit said, hey, it's time for you to go somewhere else. Have you ever been in the middle of really good work and someone offered you another job? Have you ever been a pastor in a church where you thought, hey, really good things are happening, and then you were invited to go start a church in Brookside? Have you ever done something so great, so wonderful, and you're like, I'm changing lives, I'm making a difference, people like me, and then all of a sudden God asks you to do something in a very different place, in a very different way than you've ever known? This is what's happening. Philip was doing good work and was called to leave that good work and go somewhere else. That's uncomfortable, isn't it? when we're already working really hard to make a difference in the community that we're a part of. Now, Philip, I'm going to need you to go and do something else. What if Philip said, no thank you? 
What if Philip said, no, nah, God, I'm good right where I am. This is working out really well for me. People like me. It's good money. I'm job security, right? Like those are all things that I think many of us have said in those moments in our lives when we've been offered an opportunity that sometimes makes us a little uncomfortable. If Philip would have said, not yet, Lord, or, or I'll go tomorrow, I'll go, but I'm going to go on my own terms, he would have missed an opportunity to change a very important person's life. So we have to talk about this Ethiopian eunuch for a minute. Um, do you know how far Ethiopia is from Israel? Somebody tell me. Oh, you don't. Okay. Yeah, I had to Google it because I don't know either. It's about 2,000 miles. It's about 1,600 miles from border to border, and you've got to go, uh, like, they're south of the Sinai Peninsula. They're south of whatever that is, the, not Mediterranean, it's the Red Sea. No. Yeah, it is the Red Sea. Okay, yeah, so they're south of the Red Sea. It's a 2,000-mile, roughly, journey from north Ethiopia to Israel. This Ethiopian eunuch was in charge of the treasury of the Kandaki. So the Kandaki is like the, the queen of Ethiopia, right? He's an important person. But this Ethiopian eunuch was a eunuch. Does everybody understand the term eunuch? It's a person who has had uh, work done. <laughs> a person who has uh, been emasculated. What? Gelded. Yes, if we're speaking in terms of horses. You should know this. <laughs> Full circle. Uh, so an Ethiopian eunuch who is in charge of the queen's treasury, very important person, is somebody who would have been considered an outsider to the Israelites. Not just an outsider, but pretty extremely an outsider. There has been this overriding feeling in ancient Israel since the very beginning of the recording of Scripture where these people, the Israelites, are God's chosen people and they're the only ones who have full access to God. They were people who built tabernacles and had this special sp place of worship everywhere they went, everywhere they traveled as they went through the promised land and, and began to become more um, uh, occupiers of the land. They had a special place where they worshiped God, and eventually when they had a land of their own, they built the temple. It is the only one like it in all the world that worships God, the creator of all things. That's where they had their worship, and the only people who could go to worship in the temple were Israelites. They could not be Ethiopians, and they certainly couldn't be eunuchs. It was a very exclusive time in the life of Scripture, and while you might be able to tell that this eunuch was able to worship in some way, right? Because as we pick up the story, he has gone into Jerusalem to worship. He had come from Ethiopia to worship in Israel. And now as he's leaving Jerusalem, remember, Philip meets him on the road to between Jerusalem and Gaza. As he's leaving, he hears the eunuch reading. So this person who was a double outsider, there were laws about how close to God he could come. He couldn't worship in the temple because of his, the state of his manhood. And he certainly come, couldn't come to worship because he was a proselyte, which means he was not a, a full-blood Jewish person. So he would have been able to participate at some level. It's just the scripture is unclear as to what level it was. He certainly wasn't able to go offer sacrifices in the temple. He was kept at a distance. He wasn't able to fully participate, but he traveled 2,000 miles to go to Jerusalem to find a way to participate in some way. He was that excited about his faith. Have you ever been like that on a Sunday morning? Thank you for chuckling. I appreciate that. Because like I struggle sometimes to get up and to just get a shower and get to church. And I, if you're anything like me, don't get me wrong. I love what I do, and I love you, and I love church. But sometimes I forget the importance of faith. 
I forget the importance of being near to people who believe like me, who support me when things are going wrong, who pray for me when I'm sick, or my wife who has pneumonia right now. Like, I, sorry, she has pneumonia. Um, We forget the importance of church, and this man traveled 2,000 miles to just be in the presence of God. Do you know how long it would have taken to travel 2,000 miles? Yeah. Okay, so 40 days. You know what 40 days means? Young people, what does 40 days mean? Heck of a long time, time, right? (laughs) 40 days, 40 nights, that's that's the understanding. So it would have taken, I I Googled it, it was 26 days, so it's roughly 30 days. So somewhere between 26 and 40 days is what we're talking about. And if you're traveling with other people, everybody, we all know this as dads, don't we? That every every time there's a convenience store, we got to stop and pee, right? So when you're traveling with groups of people, it wasn't a quick jaunt down to Israel. It was 2,000 miles. It was a month of travel one direction. That's how excited this Ethiopian eunuch was about faith. And man, sometimes it's just so easy to sleep through church on Sunday, right? Ethiopian eunuchs could have participated on a certain level. We don't know for sure what that looks like. But according to the book of Leviticus, chapter 21, verses 16 through 20, they could certainly not serve as priests. i got some scripture I want us to read together. It says this, The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, For the generations to come, none of your descendants who has a defect may come near to offer the food of his God, which means a sacrifice. No man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed. No man with a crippled hand or foot or who is a hunchback or a dwarf or who has an eye defect or who has a festering or running sores or damaged testicles. Clearly, (laughs) there was such a prevalence of men who were castrated in some way that it had to be specifically mentioned. Later on in in Deuteronomy 23, chapter 23, verse 1, it says this, that they couldn't even be accepted into the assembly of God's people at all. It says, no one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. This is very specific. And I bet this Ethiopian eunuch felt a little targeted. And it's clear that he would have been an outsider. He wouldn't have had the ability to fully participate according to their most current understanding of who God is and what God wants for God's people. The Hebrew scriptures forbade him from offering sacrifices in the temple, which meant that his sin offering that was supposed to be given up was never happening. So he was constantly kept in a state of perpetual understood sin. And the Holy Spirit led Philip to be in this place at this time to meet this outsider exactly where he was. If Philip would have waited, he would have missed it. If he would have said no, the Ethiopian would not have had a conversion experience. Philip's obedience to the Spirit led to a change that should still impact us, friends. Outsiders who were considered unworthy of the assembly of God are now included. This is a strong message that God is giving us through Scripture. God was intentional to send an emissary, a missionary, an evangelist to tell somebody about God, to explain what he already knew in part, right? He was going to worship. On the way back, how do we, how do we meet this eunuch? What is he doing? You could say it louder. Reading. Reading. He's reading scripture. He believes in God, yet was kept at arm's length from the church. The church, right? This should be an example for us that when we are obedient to God's call, that we can be sure that we will also be making an impact in the lives of people around us. When we don't hesitate, when we don't say, God, but that makes me feel a little awkward or uncomfortable. If we say yes and are obedient to God's call, we can make a difference in the lives of people too, just like Philip did. Here's what's funny about this conversion story. 
this person, this Ethiopian eunuch, n- knew God to an extent, right? He worshiped God, went 2,000 miles to go worship God, was in the temple, knew scripture, was reading it out loud. You ever done that before? Just read the Bible out loud? But it took somebody who knew Jesus personally to help correct theology, to help show him who Jesus is, to help tell him what Jesus expected, to show him that the kingdom was bigger than the words on the page. There's more to it than Scripture, right? In the United Methodist Church, we believe that there are four basic things in in the best way that we encounter God. Scripture, reason, experience, tradition. All of those things make faith complete for us. And here, Philip is telling him firsthand accounts about what Jesus expects, who Jesus was, how Jesus loved, the difference that Jesus made. And in a moment, that Ethiopian eunuch said, all right, I've got to have all of that. And they say, stop the wagon train or whatever it is. Stop the caravan. Let's get out. Let's get baptized. How many of you remember your baptism? You remember it? Why are you chuckling? Oh, gosh. So, clearly. You remember it clearly? No? I, I was pretty tiny, too. Many of us, if you grew up United Methodist, there's, there's nothing wrong with infant baptism. How many of you want to get baptized again? Trick question, you can't. So, sorry, I'm looking at Jeff. This is... <laughs> so, so, here's the deal. This guy was so excited about the message that he received about Jesus... That he said, stop everything. We have got to pause this trip so that I can be baptized. I I think we forget how radical the message of Jesus was that this outsider who couldn't become Jewish got to skip a whole step. He didn't have to be circumcised. He didn't, well, there was some already already some other stuff (laughs) happening. Yeah. Uh, he didn't have to be circumcised. It doesn't say that he had to follow the dietary restrictions of the Hebrews. He, he was welcomed in the state that he was found. And how did he respond after he was baptized? Well, first of all, Philip disappears, right? There's this dramatic moment where he's just gone. And then it says, the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. So often, people show up at church on a Sunday morning. It could be any church. It could be Community Brookside. It could be a Baptist church or Episcopalian or Catholic. It doesn't matter. So often, people come to church, and it's just a thing that we've had to do. And we've lost the joy of our salvation. (laughs) That's not what the church is designed for. Because of Philip's obedience, an outsider became an insider. And the same should be true for us. Our obedience should mean that people who are left out are now fully included. Let's talk for a second about this Ethiopian's hunger for truth, right? He had an earnest desire to understand God's word. We meet him. He's reading scripture out loud in a chariot on his way home. He's got a 2,000-mile trip. I, listen, I know we all have cell phones. Like When we take any road trips anywhere, our kids are always like on an iPad or on a phone or listening to something or watching videos. It was not the same. Uh, I remember being on road trips and getting coloring pages and being like, woohoo, this is so exciting. How many of you guys grew up before me who didn't have anything? You look out the window and be silent, right? Yeah. Sit there and be quiet. This guy was like, you know what? I'm so excited about the worship encounter and experience that I had in Jerusalem. Traveled all this way. I got a month to go back home. Let's read some scripture. And he's reading it out loud. And Philip hears him. That's how loud he's reading it. Do you know what you're reading about? How can I unless somebody explains it to me? Come on in. All of that's odd, right? Stop at a gas station, just reading scripture out loud while you're filling up the car. 
Do you know what it is you're reading? No, come in, let's go for a 2,000 mile trip and let's talk about it. Strange. strange, right? Like it's weird. He wanted to please God so much that he traveled these 2,000 miles and on the way home couldn't get enough. Went to church, couldn't present his offering. He wasn't fully included, but he went to the area. I'm here. I just want to be around my people. And then left without a full encounter or an experience. And so he hasn't had enough and still keeps reading scripture. Guys, there is no Sunday that should ever be enough for you. If we're not picking up our Bibles during the week, we are not doing what we're supposed to be doing. If we're not reading God's word, if we're not living out God's word in our lives, we're not doing it right. We have been insiders so long in this country that we have no idea what, it'd be, what it would be like to love God but not be able to worship God. To not be able to fully participate. And as a reminder, there was a time where you and I would have been considered outsiders too, right? How many of you are actually Jewish? You've done the ancestry, you have the, just, you are really? 1%. Okay, well, it's good enough for me, I suppose. But none of us in here are Jewish. Oh, wait, what? Yaya's actual dad is Jewish. I've done the genetics. We're not. You aren't. Oh. Oh. Well, it's not, it's not a threat. Like, I mean, okay, that's right. I guess I'm not. We'll talk to, we'll talk. Nicole, I need you to just text me if we're Jewish or not. All right. So, and if she's not watching, I'll know. I'm putting my phone right here. Um... <laughs> So because we're not Jewish, we would not have been included either. None of us is worthy enough to go to the temple to worship God. Not one of us. We can't give offerings. We can't offer, offer sacrifices. We can't meet with a priest. None of that happens because we are outsiders, but there was something that made it different for us. That something is a person named Jesus, right? And in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, 11 through 22, it says this, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near to the, by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humani humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God, through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You, friends, are the place where God dwells. We were separated. We were lost. We were not citizens of the kingdom. But because of Christ Jesus, we are united. We are all made one. We are fellow citizens with God's people. And then the great news is we are, we are the dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. And we could not have been made fully a part of what God is doing in the world until Jesus showed up and showed us what the kingdom of God should look like. If you remember, Jesus invited in the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. Jesus forgave those who had been condemned and offered second chances where punishment prescribed was death. That's the Jesus that we love. That's the Jesus that we follow. And that's the Jesus whose life we should be exemplifying in the way that we speak to each other and the way that we love our neighbors. Jesus opened the temple of God to people who were outsiders and sent out his disciples two by two to witness to God and all the Gentiles living in Israel and the surrounding areas. 
And this eunuch that was doubly an outsider was a Gentile and he was deformed. And he was brought inside too. When we hear the truth of God, it should make a difference in our responses. When we hear the truth of God, it should bring joy to us in such a way that it excites us to tell the world about who Jesus is. The eunuch heard about Christ for the very first time, was baptized, and was rejoicing. And I imagine 2,000 miles of rejoicing would have been a little tiring, but I bet it was awesome. The way that the eunuch began to understand Scripture more fully was because he had somebody who knew the Scripture more, who had a personal encounter with Jesus that changed him, and he was able to connect Scripture and Gospel, which were two different things at the time, together. Gospel is the good news with the Scripture, that is the law and the prophets, brought those things together to make a difference. When Philip explained it, it led to the eunuch's conversion and his baptism. So that should say that sometimes all it takes is a better understanding of Jesus to make the difference in people's lives. So friends, we should be willing to ask the questions in the middle of our doubt, and we should be willing to offer up our knowledge once we get the answers to those questions to people who still don't know. We have to be a safe place for people to come and learn about Jesus, not the church, not United Methodism, not um, what it looks like to be a, you know, post-modern uh, Christian living in a uh, quasi-democratic American society. You know what I mean? Like, we want to define and break stuff down, and all we have to do is tell the world about who Jesus is, and it should make the biggest difference ever. And we can't tell what we don't know. If we're not opening our Bibles, if we're not coming to Sunday school, if we're not coming to church on a regular basis, if we're not surrounding ourselves with a community of believers, we are not going to be able to answer the questions when they come at us. The eunuch's immediate baptism and rejoicing illustrates the joy of salvation and the spread of the gospel to everybody Jesus didn't come so that people can be left out, right? There's not a single person that Jesus met and he said, yep, sorry, you're not good enough. And so that can't be the church's response either. I want to be very clear that as a pastor in this church, I don't know how to spark in you the joy of your salvation. I can't trigger that. I don't know what to do. I, I hope that we're reminding you of that joy of your salvation. But if this is all you get during the week, I promise you're going to lose your joy. If this is the extent of your faith, an hour a week on Sunday morning, it's not enough to make a difference in your own life, much less the lives of people around you. God calls us to be joyful. God wants us to be joyful, just like this Ethiopian man was. And it's hard to be joyful in a world like ours, isn't it? When it just seems like everybody is so hateful and hurtful. We are called to bring joy wherever we are. And if we're not filling our lives with joy, we can't empty ourselves of that joy into the lives of others either. So friends, we have to be attentive to the Spirit's leading. We have to understand how and when and why the Spirit is calling us. We have to pay attention to God's leading us because only then we'll be able to make a difference. We have to read our scriptures. We have to understand the, the salvific power of the life of Jesus Christ. And then we have to share that transformative joy with all people around us. And this scripture reminds us that we have to go to the places that are really unexpected. We have to go at the times that we really don't necessarily want to go. We have to do the things that God calls us to do and be obedient because people's lives are dependent on us sometimes. 
What a great reminder of our jobs as followers of Jesus Christ. So friends, as we prepare to leave this place today, be Jesus to the world. Even when it's inconvenient, even when it's not the right place or the right time, be a voice for justice and righteousness. Be a voice for those who don't have one. What a great story. What's even more beautiful about this story is it's a beautiful reminder that many of us this last week have started school. And we're going to be in places where there are some people who are actively hostile to the movement of Christianity in America. So here's what I want to say to that. Teachers, do your best, right? Students, do your best at representing your faith everywhere you are. You never know when you might impact somebody like this Ethiopian eunuch. Thank you so much for joining us on today's Community Cast. We hope that you were blessed by today's conversation. If you'd like to know more about Community Brookside, please feel free to visit us at our website, communitybrookside.com, or find us on your favorite social media outlet. We hope to hear from you soon. Be blessed.